with that, next slide, I'd like to um, hand over to Lincoln Black, who is a senior industrial designer at Tiller Design. Um, welcome, Lincoln. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Yeah, and look, I'd like um, to start, Lincoln, if you could just give us a, a little bit of your background and how you came to be um, at Tiller and, and what you're doing. Uh, yeah, so that's a good segue into the first slide. Uh, so yeah, I'm a uh, industrial designer. I've been an uh, industrial designer for about 18 years or something now. Graduated from Newcastle University when they still had an industrial design course that's sort of slowly been dismantled now. Um, my first job out of, out of uni was a uh, design and engineering consultancy. Spent four years there doing some consumer devices, but um, mostly industry. Um, so we did a, did a bit of work there, some medical devices, but uh, not, not a lot. Um, so out of that, I went into orthopedic device design. So, you know, developing a lot of implants and instruments. And um, that was where I spent most of my, where I've spent most of my career. Um, initially started out doing a lot of the design work, but as the, as the company grew, um, moved into the manager's position and managed a, a team of industrial designers and um, engineers and um, towards the end of that time there I moved to Ireland for a year and set up a second design team that was uh, that was quite interesting uh, quite fun uh, spending spending time in Ireland and in fact the um, medical device community in Ireland is is something to be held it's uh, it's very active and the Irish government's putting a lot of a lot of effort into growing that as well so um, quite a lot of you know a lot of interest there and you know gained a lot of experience working in yeah spending that 12 months there um so then after returning back from from ireland it's been a couple of years um well now been nearly a couple of years at tiller design so doing uh doing a lot of the design uh working on a fairly you know large project at the moment which is you know medical device and um you know doing i think robert spoke in in his talk a few weeks ago or a few months ago um about translational research, so that, that's we're quite heavy in, into that with this particular project. So it's it's quite exciting. So just leading on to them, then um, currently at Tilda Design, probably worth giving them a um, bit of an update. Um, yeah, nearly thirty years Tilda's been uh, been operating. Um, do a work in a fairly broad range of sectors. You know, consumer heavy industry, mining and military. But in the last several years, there's been a really strong focus in the medical device space. And I think that in Australia, that's that's a really growing uh, growing industry. And um, I think that in the years to come, we're going to see more of that. I think it's going to be pretty exciting. Um, but Tiller Design does a full full life cycle um, design, which is you know, developing the um, R&D and feas feasibility of the design and then doing the translational research, as I said, uh, working through human factors, doing the design and development, um, and then right through to design and manufacture and actually, you know, offloading that to manufacturers. Um, and likewise, we're also 13405 uh, certified. So this is sort of what I want to go through today. Um, it's a very top level look at industrial design. I've tried to make it kind of a a pragmatic overview um, talk through the design process and and what we do as we go through um, you know develop a new design um, new product um, and I'll look sort of I'll walk through the process itself it'll be uh, you know which is yeah for those in medical devices it's it's not un, unknown it's you know understanding what the users are you know user requirements and product requirements developing the concepts of those um, proving out the design, verifying and validating it, and then refining the design based on what we learn. Um, and that process is a cyclical process, which I'll go through um, doing the design transfer and implementing that, which is pushing it into production. Um, whether um, it, it normally as a consultancy, the uh, industrial design process kind of stops at that um, at that design transfer, but we quite often, um, you know, obviously it's developing a a package that's then used to uh, manufacture the device. Um, and I wanted can to... I, yeah, Lincoln, can. I'll, be in, I'll be very interested throughout the course of your presentation, um, I guess, to sort of 
note any differences between, I guess, normal industrial design for, you might say, for consumer or uh, mining or industrial kind of application, yeah. versus something you do for medical. You, yeah. you mentioned ISO 13405, and obviously there's a lot of documentation involved. Yeah. But there are things like biocompatibility, you know, things where people, um, you know, with, where, where things are touching your skin and therefore, um, you know. So uh, have you got any general comments at the start about the differences between industrial design for medical devices as opposed to, uh, um, you know, all other devices? Yeah, so like as I go through this, I do make a few points that sort of compare the two and where some things are more critical in medical device design. Um, but there's, uh, yeah, it's, it's generally it's about the documentation um, side of things and traceability in terms of why certain decisions were made um, and and having the evidence to show that you know these decisions were made for these these good reasons um, and also you know the traceability of the design uh, the design outputs back to the design inputs so uh, for you know often for consumer products and things where there's you know those quality management requirements are not in place uh, the need to to maintain the traceability of all of that design and development is much, um, there's a much lower requirement for that. Uh, so, and it, it, some of that will depend on the clients, but, um, but we're in medical devices, it's a requirement to, you know, to maintain a lot more traceability around, you know, why the decisions were made and then also verifying and validating those decisions. And do you start that right from the very first engagement with the client or do you sort of go through this process of doing some initial work and then kicking in the documentation later on? Uh, it kind of depends. Um, generally, generally you do, but it, it does depend on where the client is at with their development um, and how much of their requirements they actually already know. So in many, in many circumstances where, especially where we're developing, um, you know, we're sort of still somewhat in the research phase or we don't fully understand what the product is. Uh, it's sometimes a little bit early to start building requirements and, uh, and that kind of thing. So quite often there can be sort of like a, you know, a, a, almost a pre, you know, 13485, you know, which is, which is really doing the, um, developing the concept further and understanding what it really is that we want to design. Um, and at that point, then developing the design of it, you know, building the requirements and, you know, design inputs and then going from there. So, so it sort of, it goes, it, it can be, you know, we can start right at the very beginning and start building the requirements immediately, but quite often in some very early phase projects where we're still trying to understand what it is that we want, um, it's sometimes too early to, to build those requirements. We can start to do it on some level. Um, but yeah, it's one of those sure. things that often needs to be developed before it can be fully documented. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So and, and just at the tail end here, one of my things that I like to, I think it's one of the things that I like most about industrial design is the human centered design. Uh, and I just wanted to go into a little bit of additional detail on that. Um, so industrial design is. Yeah, it really come about sort of around the same time as the industrial revolution where we had a change from, you know, handcrafted goods by a craftsman um, into something that was, you know, there was a need for design for mechanization and mass production. Um, and there's a, there's a, it sort of required a new set of skills where there was a, under, it was no longer about, you know, knowing what the customer wants and designing and building it with that particular customer, but looking more broadly, looking at new materials and the new manufacturing processes, which early on in the industrial revolution was, you know, it was quite a you know, big thing. Um, and being able to bring those together in terms of, you know, merging those materials and those new methods um, and turning those into mass produced goods. Um, but industrial design is not just about how we, you know, turn, how, how we make something look like, you know, what we want it to and how does it fit, but it's also, you know, a very holistic look at the whole product. It's not just um, the product itself, but how it's assembled, how it's made, uh, what materials it's made from, 
um, you know, and then how do we, how do we use that product? You know, how do we dispose of that product? And I think that that, especially in the last, you know, one or two years, the, um, the disposal of the product has become a much bigger um, part of the design process. And we're, we're starting to think about sustainability and um, recyclability, you know, um, disassembly, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and even the materials, using recycled materials, um, using, you know, biomaterials and, and that kind of thing. So, um, so the industrial design process is, you know, more than just what we actually see in the product. It, ex it sort of extends to, you know, before the product is really on the market and then what happens when the product is finished. So it's a, it's a very broad uh, gamut. Uh, I've got this little diagram here, which, yeah, this is how I like to think of industrial design. It's, there's a, and it, the, the spectrum can vary a bit depending on different industrial designers. There's always a um, element of art and engineering in industrial design. Um, but I think there's also a level of psychology, which I'll go through around the human centered design. We, cause we, we as humans have interesting behaviors and some are kind of predictable and some are unpredictable. And I think understanding that and translating how we understand that into products is, is also part of the, part of the process. Uh, I'll go through that in more detail. Lincoln, um, when you, you meant, I, I really pleased to, you've, you know, brought up the art one there and the engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about art, you know, we always look at sort of Apple as the, you know, the classic case study, you know, which really brought the aesthetics of a device and the branding of a device to the fore. Yep. Um, you know, to what extent is that sort of still very relevant in medical devices, which, you know, to certain, on a certain level, you know, the practical tools in the hands of surgeons and therapists and, and so forth, uh, but they've still got to have that wow factor, haven't they? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, I think that you're right. Medical devices is very much, um, form follows function. Um, but I think that as, I think that we're becoming as a market medical devices and I think clinicians are becoming a bit more mature in their, um, in what they expect of a product. And, and I, we even saw this in orthopedics was the, um, a lot of the devices, even though orthopedics is a very, in many ways, it's, it's not a highly advanced, um, medical device, you know, they're, they've been around many, many years and they haven't changed a great deal, you know, in the last couple of decades, but, um, but there's an expectation from clinicians, um, now to, to see, you know, higher finish levels, you know, more, um, yeah, much more aesthetic integration into those devices. So I think that the market has, has matured. I think that there's, um, uh, there's a need now for medical devices to, to look cool and to, you know, work how they you know work how they look in many ways um so it's not enough anymore i think to to actually just make it work i think it's also got a um you know it's got to look great and i think that it yeah i talk about this a little bit further on about um you know visual communication and, and how we understand how a product works but yeah it's it's an important and i think that market share can be gained just by having a really you know slick looking product um, yeah, which is a, which is a big part of, you know, industrial design and, but it's not, yeah, maybe that's selling a little bit short. It's, it's still got to work how we think it should work as well. So achieving those things is often a very delicate balance. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, and maybe I've just answered my question already. So what would you need an industrial designer for? Um, you know, and I think that industrial designers, especially in a consultancy, um, you know, they, they, they're experts at bringing ideas into, into the real world. And that's, that's really, you know, the fundamental of industrial designer is, is taking those ideas and developing them through and working them and being able to translate that into product. Um, you know, they're, they're usually observant lateral thicker thinkers, um, good at solving problems. Uh, an important one is in the consultancy is that, you know, we do a lot of, you know, very broad, um, spectrum in terms of the kinds of devices we develop. So it gives us lots of exposure to new materials and processes and technologies. Um, but so then there's a lot of sort of cross-pollination 
um, in terms of those ideas that we can sort of bring to the table. Um, <laughs> I had a bit of a joke with, with Robert once um, about you know, industrial designers being belligerent and um, yeah, obviously being respectful, respectfully belligerent is uh, important, but I think that uh, industrial designers have a bent, I think, to develop, you know, to really push on some of the assumptions that, you know, that we sometimes just take for granted, um, you know, asking some questions can about, I, yeah. Yeah, go Tim. Can I jump in there? Um, you notice, you know, exposed to a broad spectrum products, materials, process technologies. Yeah. That's, that was the thing that really struck me when I first walked into an industrial design house. I remember seeing, um, one of these buttons that was on a medical device, but um, because of the requirement for cleanliness, uh, you know, the button couldn't be a normal button. It had to be one that was underneath, uh, uh, I'm not even sure that you call it, but the skin, you know, to keep yeah. out liquids and materials. And mm -hmm. and you can't can really easily Google those kind of things, or, or even if you can, you still need to know the right words and terms as so mm -hmm. I, I just came up short then what kind of button that is mm -hmm. um and just knowing the names of those things there's just uh, an astounding array of um technologies out there that could be used uh how on earth do you keep track of what what's possible with all these different you know physical elements that can go into a a, a device given the variety of products you didn't go um yeah it's a it's a good one and i think that um our brains are you know probably well obviously we don't understand them but there's it seems to be room for little tidbits of information that we can you know you often try and bring up or bring out you know when we need them um and a lot of it comes to experience and i think that you know once upon a time, you may have worked on a project that had a, you know, some sort of unique attribute, and then many years later, you know, being able to bring that up again and and maybe reapply that concept in a new in a new project is, um, you know, it's it some, happens quite a lot. And I think that uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's just experience, and you know, experienced designers have obviously had a much longer time to be exposed to these kinds of things. And I think I imagine that, it's I imagine it's also the ability to to find out information. So I remember once being very alarmed going to a doctor's for some particular problem and uh, they looked at me and said, mm, not sure about that and reached to their shelf and brought down a large book and started flicking through the pages to try and you know, find out yeah. you know something. But the point was they they knew how to look up the book. They knew what the words all meant in the book. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think, and I, I guess it goes for every industry and every person. And the more experience you have in a certain area, you kind of know, you start to know what you don't know. Um, yeah, so in, so then you can sort of start delving into areas that are similar or related, and and start finding out, you know, trying to understand the bits that you don't don't know. So um, yeah, and I think again that sort of goes to experience. Is that if you have some some kind of inkling of what it could be, then you at least you know. As you said, you, you sort of know where to start looking. Um, yeah, so it's it's uh, it's interesting, you know. And, uh, you know, a lot of my experience has been in orthopedics, which is a very you know, heavily sort of surgical, um, you know, invasive environment, and and a lot of that is very hard to know. Um, yeah, as you said, you can't Google that sort of stuff. You know, working inside a you know a, a joint space or you know, lots of soft tissue issues and things like that, which are sort of hard to quantify. So, um, yeah, it's just experience. <clears throat> the last one I've added in, I think that this one, and this will sort of speak to some of the other, the later um, slides I've got is that I think industrial designers and, and designers in general are very versatile. Um, you know, the, the, a large part of the design is the design process, um, which is what I'm gonna talk through today. Um, and it's it, that process can be applied in many different ways in many different areas. Um, I've listed a few here, system design, service design, interface design, and environmental design. Um, and I've known industrial designers personally that have, um, that have sort of specialized in these particular areas. Um, 
So, you know, it's one of those things that the, the process can actually then be reapplied to a lot of different specializations. And I think that you know, designers are particularly versatile. And again, it's kind of necessary in a consultancy because, you know, you could be working on two separate projects, you know, that are, you know, astoundingly different. So you've got to be able to, you know, apply the same methodology to both of them. Um, so this is a design process. Um, I've sort of tailored it a little bit to, to suit medical devices and use some of the um, medical terminology just to help make it a little bit more applicable. Um, but generally, you know, we sort of have requirements that feed into the design and development process. Um, and the design and, design and development process is, is really sort of, you know, working on the design, developing concepts, you know, prototyping, verifying and validating those concepts, which gives us a greater understanding of what we're, um, you know, what we're trying to do and learning some of the things that we don't know and then repeating the process and, and developing that design further. Um, and then ultimately we do that enough iterations. Um, we have a very fine, you know, very highly refined design and then we can finalize the design. From there, it goes to design transfer and, um, you know, becomes a, a data pack as it were that can then go to manufacture. Um, and as a little, a little bit of what I indicated before, the application of the design process uh, can be applied to many different sectors. Um, sorry, I've got a six-year-old trying to make lunch. Um, here we have a, uh, you know, while industrial design is generally known as a, you know, for consumer products, it actually, the process can actually be applied to many industries there. You know, I've got, this, got several that I've sort of already listed, but also you know, user experience and user interface design is is probably a one of the largest growing areas for for design. Um, you know, with our with our digital sort of experience now being a, a large part of everyone's lives. Um, environmental design, textile design, and interior um, building and architecture. So, and that last one's not necessarily you know civil engineering or architecture exactly, but applying that design process and being able to do, um, be, augment those sort of, those sectors um, with the industrial design thinking. So, um, 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 certainly Lincoln, what springs to mind uh, with that last one is that in medical devices, it's, um, if you just go back a slide, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, that one? Yeah, in that one, yeah, is that, the we often think of medical devices as just the device but those devices sit in an environment uh, and um, one of the projects we're working on is we're actually designing an entire laboratory yeah look around the device yeah. and, and the workflow and the information management systems we're going to be having you know uh, screens saying you know for an operator say it's time to go and you know attend to the you know the production of this particular uh, medical um, output yeah. and so uh, you know that that whole workflow or, or the you know the human as you say the human sending design of people flowing through an environment and using the device yeah. um, in a patient on a bed in a theater or whatever yeah all, all of that i imagine comes to bear on the design of the device itself that's yeah exactly right yeah and and especially in medical devices, that's critical. Um, you know, if it's, and I'll talk about this again, but, um, you know, if you're in a theater, you have to think about theater lights. You know, if you're, uh, if you're in someone's home, then you have to think about, you know, how they clean the device or how do they store the device. So the actual design of the device is, is really a product of um, all of these different factors that go into, you know, how it, you know, why it is the way it is. Um, and this is really what builds into the requirements here and um, and in many sort of non-medical devices this is called the design brief but it, it, it's actually requirements you know what does the client want um, and we sort of build that using we're trying to get an understanding of all the different stakeholders um, you know customers users uh, product requirements and if, particularly important for medical devices is re regulatory requirements. Uh, and a good one, which is you kind of 
kind of what you sort of hinted at there, Tim, is that, yeah, the implied requirements, which nobody ever says it, and it's never written anywhere. Uh, but by how we want to use the device, you know, there is a cascade of requirements that we need to fully understand. And in medical devices, they need, these need to be documented. Um, and of course, we have um, you know, requirements that would mitigate risk, which is part of the risk mitigation, which is required in medical devices. Um, yeah, and this, again, you know, understanding users and context is a, is a really important step to the design process and especially in medical devices. Um, you know, it helps us build those requirements and, you know, one of the things that needs to be considered, which I sort of hinted at earlier is, you know, who will use the device um, and where will they use it? Um, and a lot of these things are particularly important in medical devices, particularly what I've got there is cognitive limitations. Um, you know, so who is using that device and, um, you know, do they have a physical impairment? Do they have a, you know, cog cognitive impairment? Um, and how do we design for them and, and make it a, you know, a, a good product for them to use that's, you know, going to be safe and uh, efficacious? Um, and where the device uses, again, like I said, the theatre lights can have a huge impact on, you know, usability uh, if it's being, in, if it's working in theatre. Um, but as I talked about in the beginning about the full life cycle of a product, you know, we need to also consider what kind of users are using it, you know, throughout the, the life cycle, um, not just the user, or not just the patient, you know, do we, do we have, is there a service personnel that have to repair it or have to service it, replace some components? Um, and then at the end of the life, life cycle of the product, um, the product, is it disassembled? You know, is it recycled? Is it thrown, thrown out? You know, are there hazards associated with, you know, certain, you know, dangerous materials or, or whatever. So, so this is all part of the, all of these requirements, um, all, all of these sort of um, aspects of the design um, go into those requirements. And as industrial designers, we, we, we do the research interview and we, we study to, to understand who those users are and what the context is. Um, so once we understand what the users are and, and where the users will be using the device, uh, and I, like I'm saying here, medical device or device, but uh, but again, the design because the design process can apply to many different uh, areas. It may not be a, a device. It could be, you know, as you said, it could be a whole room. Um, yeah, so initially, we, we sort of explore very quick um, ideas and ideate, which is really just like trying to come up with lots of, you know, quick ideas. Um, often that's a brainstorming session as a group. Um, quite often it's also individuals or a combination of, of the both. Um, and the idea is really to develop lots of quick ideas and, and come up with solutions um, to some of those design problems that have been highlighted um, through the requirements. Um, and these sorts of concepts can actually be the whole, you know, the whole device. And in, in this illustration here, you can see we're looking at a, at what the device appearance might look like and maybe how it's, you know, how the door opens and that kind of stuff. Um, but concepts can also, concept development can also focus on certain aspects of the design. Um, you know, like a battery door, how a battery door opens, um, you know, what a clip, how does a clip work? How does a button work? That kind of stuff. So. It's really a combination of, um, of these many little aspects that are kind of worked through to solve each of the problems, either in, you know, as a total or, or in sort of detail. Um, but the important thing is uh, that the ch changes that you do in the design at a concept, very early concept development stage are cheap. You know, they, they're, it's really uh, inexpensive to, to iterate quickly come up with lots of ideas and come up with lots of bad ideas. Um, because the last thing you want to do is, is realize that you've come up with a bad idea when you've already got, you know, tooling made or you've already got, or, you, or worse still, the products already in, the products in the market. You know, you can see that, uh, that making changes later on become exponentially more costly. So, so doing the concept development is, a, is the best time to, Kind of come up with those dumb ideas and you know work them through and turn them into good ideas um you know it's, it's much more 
um, time effective, time and cost effective way to, to develop the design. It's interesting when you talk about the word concept, you know, it's always been a little bit confusing to me because for me, when I think about a concept, um, quite often that's what the customer uh, or the, you know, the entrepreneur or the, the innovator has come to you with. They have, they have a concept for, you know, an ultrasound device or, a, you know, an algorithm to do X, Y or Z. And so they've already got the kind of, you know, what it is that they want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of kind of like the core of the concept. Yeah. So, uh, is what you're doing sort of, as you say in that in the title, they're developing that concept and, and sort of finishing it and making it more real. Is that what you're doing? That's right. Yeah, and and as I sort of said, the design process is quite cyclical. Um, so yeah, we can start with really the the core of the idea. Um, and then keep working the idea to advance and develop it um, and refine it until it's a finished product. Um, so, so how many sort of iterations need to be done is in many way, and I say not necessarily iterations, but it's constantly developing it and reevaluating it and taking what we learn and reapplying it to the design is something that is, um, it is something that can happen a variable amount of times depending on how advanced the device is when it comes to you. Um, so, mm -hmm. and again, like, you know, when we're looking at translational research or, or products that are, are really just tonight, just the core of the idea and, and there's not, hasn't been any sort of uh, real development done, there's a, there's a lot more work that needs to be done to fully understand what the product is before you can sort of, you know, design it. So, uh, whereas, you know, if, if a customer come to you with something that, they already had some prototypes, they've already done some user testing, all that kind of stuff. Um, it can accelerate the development. Um, so yeah, it's a variable based on, I guess, where um, where the product is at when it comes to you. Um, and, and also sometimes is through working through the problem, you may also find that a fairly advanced design that that comes to you needs to, needs to be sort of redone, you know, based on, new things that we learn so which again goes back to what i was saying about you know the expense of development early versus versus later through the uh through the development yeah i mean um i'll give you an example for from an electronics perspective um because for those of you who don't know my, my 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 day job is with genesis electronics um design we had a customer came to us recently with a very quite a well-developed um, idea and already they had trials in hospitals and so forth. Um, and they were quite clear that they wanted a, um, a Bluetooth connection, you know, built into this thing and it was going to be all, all wireless. And, and then as we developed the concept and we looked at the commercial envelope and, and the unit cost, you know, it became pretty clear pretty quickly that they weren't going to get to market at the price they wanted mm -hmm. by including the, the components that they needed. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the concept developed from a, um, you know, a wireless one to a sort of a semi-wireless one. Um, I can't go into the detail any further, but, but that's an example of, you know, how the concept evolved actually quite strongly in terms of its functionality and so forth, as you say there. And, you that's know, right. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. These similar examples you might have in the industrial design side of things. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, one of the projects that yeah that we've worked on recently is, is in many ways it's been the same though it hasn't been cost based. It's been really around usability and um, you know the, it was designed a certain way and and there was a fairly strong idea around how it was going to work, but but through starting to understand the requirements more and you know, that was, it was, it became pretty clear that it needed to be looked at again. So I know that's very, uh, very vague, but um, yeah, but rather than being, you know, re cost based reasons to, to need to reevaluate the design, it was, it was sort of usability and, and maybe in many ways not really fully understanding those requirements at the beginning. So um, yeah, it's, yeah, it happens, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, so verifying, validating design, which you know we, we more simply call prototyping, is uh, is really just taking those concepts and um, and starting to test them in the real world environment. Um, 
we, yeah, because a lot of things are developed now in, you know, in CAD and we have 3D printers available to us, this is actually much easier to do much faster um, than it used to be. Uh, I remember, you know, when I went through university, 3D printers were kind of not really a thing that you had. And yeah, you could send out some CAD models and pay somebody to, to 3D print them. But now, you know, everybody's got a 3D printer in the garage that they can sort of just run some printers out. So, so the, so the development cycle very early on is very easy to, to sort of verify, um, you know, how it's going to work. So, um, so, and, and even at every stage of the development process, these are, um, yeah, these are, this is a really important step really to, to verify that and validate the, the designs and the concepts that you're working through. Um, you know, they can be very, I've got a list here and they can be very much, very simple, you know, test jigs, form studies, which are used to test mechanically how something might work and form studies where you really just want to understand the ergonomics, you know, how something is held. Um, and these kinds of things are really important in medical devices is, you know, how is it gripped? Um, you know, how heavy is it? Um, this kind of stuff. Um, prototyping can often be a combination of those two things. You know, it may have some functionality um, combined with some shape. Um, but then, as I was saying, you know, we can do a lot of things virtually now. So FEA is a really amazing tool for, for doing some that sort of stuff, um, especially when, you know, in medical devices where you need to demonstrate safety, uh, for, you know, from a medical, from a mechanical point of view. It's finite um, element analysis, I believe. Oh, or... uh, yeah. Sorry, I should have probably yeah. put that in. Yeah, finite yeah. element analysis. Um, and likewise, renderings are good. Once upon a time, we had to, we had to make you know, and sand and paint yeah, lots of different form studies, you know, to, to have a look, have a, have a really good representation of what the product might look like and, and help us make decisions around, you know, the, the shape and color um, in finishes. But with renderings now, we can accelerate that quite a lot. Um, you know, we can try a lot more variations and, and even though it's not exactly the same as having a device in hand, um, it can go a long way to helping us make some decisions around what a product looks like just by performing um, renderings based on CAD models. Um, yeah, and then usability testing is, is quite often using you know, functional prototypes or, or something like that and, and having users um, under, use them and understand them and observing how, how they're being used. And this is something that I'll go into a little bit before uh, later on. And, and that's sort of a really the the design needs to be developed a, a little bit to get to that stage, um, especially because a lot of users are quite often judgmental. You know, it's, <laughs> it's quite, yeah, quite often the case, like if you give them sort of something that's a bit janky and very early in development, uh, then they have a bit of a prejudice against not necessarily the design, but against the, the prototype because it looks janky. And, and it's really hard once they've already made up their mind that something's not, you know, not the actual product. Um, it's very hard to have them imagine it, how it's going to be in the end. Um, so, so, so it's always good to have, you know, user testing can be sort of tricky and you've got to make sure that you know the right audience and they understand what they're doing with the device, where the device is in, in development, um, you know, and, and trying to get really good value out of, out of that testing with those users. So, and that's really critical in medical devices is, is having clinicians um you know evaluate the device and this can even be even before it goes into you know theater or you know clinical trials um it can be just having them hold it in hand and they're yeah good good clinicians that are familiar with the you know design and development process uh, are quite often able to translate what they see in a you know early prototype stage um into application without actually having to take it there so um yeah, so there, there's lots of value that can be gained from doing that. And of course, the last one I've got there is clinical trials, uh, which are quite often done with, you know, production or pre-production parts, which is, which is very late in the, um, you know, in the development cycle. And, and obviously you want to have a lot of it well resolved by then because you don't really want to be changing the design too much uh, after that. Uh, it's quite expensive. Um, yeah, and yeah, all of these things, all of these kinds of, prototypes can be refined and become more sophisticated as the development progresses. 
uh, yeah, we refine the design. So um, once we start to get, every time we iterate, and I, iterate is probably the wrong word, but every time we work through the design process, we, um, we get more and more advanced in our understanding of the device and you know, how it's going to be used, where it's going to be used and what it's made of, how it's assembled and that kind of thing. Um, and once we're, once we've started to, um, every time we go through the process, we get better and better at it and our understanding becomes greater and greater. Um, and as we get more advanced, we start to fill in some of the gaps. Um, so I've got CAD modeling there, um, you know, designed for manufacture, which is, you know, working with the tool makers to understand how the parts are going to be you know, molded if they're plastic or machined if they're machined, um, cast or, or whatever it may be. Um, you know, fits and tolerances, bill of materials, which can you know, bring in, you know, obviously the boards, uh, other components, batteries, that kind of thing. Um, you know, material specifications and process specifications. Um, and process specifications is, is an important one um, I think in medical devices, because it may be a particular treatment that's applied to some of the parts, um, or there's some, you know, you know, it could be a biological thing, you know, thing that's being applied or, or something like that. So, and these things need to be fairly well controlled and well understood uh, and documented. Um, and then sometimes the, you know, the tooling design or part of the tooling design is, is also considered um, quite often that's worked with the, uh, you know, with the tool maker to, to come up with the solution. Um, yeah, and even quite often there's value in talking early with tool makers um, to get an understanding, especially complicated parts or where there's lots of conflicting requirements, um, working with the tool maker to, to try and you know, solve those problems is, um, the earlier you do that, the less you have to change your, your design later on when they start looking at it. So, and I think James will probably, you know, he's probably got better, more experience than I have, but, you know, tool makers will always want to change something, you know, and so it's always a negotiation with, with them to, you know, to both be happy with what can be done versus what, you know, what we want to do. So. And I love, I love this diagram, Lincoln, because, you know, so often, you know, as consumers, you, you, you look at these devices on the outside and you think, oh, well, it's got a screen and some numbers and a casing and you think, you know, it doesn't look that complicated, but when you when you look at this diagram, you you, you suddenly begin to realise all the different elements that make it up and how much effort has to go into each individual part. Yeah, um, with that, that's um, right. Yeah. I notice on there, you know, you've got quite a few screws. You know, things being screwed in, which is usually a fairly uh, manual uh, mm -hmm. process, and unless you're doing high enough volume to warrant. Um, robotics mm -hmm. um have you have you seen are, are you seeing any sort of developments around the ability to just reduce the assembly cost um because when you look at this you know it just looks massively complicated you know mm -hmm. how on earth you get all these parts together mm -hmm. um particularly if it's got to be sterilized and you know sealed for medical use or something yeah uh, any thoughts on you know um just reducing assembly costs uh, yeah, and that's something that's often considered when we're doing the design um, is the assembly, you know, the assembly cost and, and how it's going to be assembled. Um, you know, so there, there's various sort of assembly techniques that have, you know, have, have names and, and there's, there's always a goal to try and make things easy to assemble. Um, so th there's a sort of a, a common I think one. It, I think it would be fair to say um, <laughs> when you look at experience, the goal is often to make it easy to assemble, but it often fo falls woefully short. Um, just, yeah. just my general observation. And, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. and I want, what I'm wondering is where that, you know, is, is it that we just don't have the sort of semi-automated techniques available um, to us? You know, yeah. Um, it, it can depend. And, and one of the things, uh, and I was sort of taught this even at university and it sort of stuck, to, stuck with me was that um, quite often we can reduce the number of parts um, and build, like kind of have several parts doing several functions. Um, the trouble with that is that it then makes the parts more complicated. Um, so then you can have, that can bring other issues. And, and the biggest one is the part cost. Um, so it's often a delicate balance between um, 
how much does the part cost to make, you know, one complicated part versus two cheaper parts. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, this, this device does a lot anyway. Um, and I think I've got another couple of images uh, further down, but so there's various parts that, that detach and, and there's lots of um, refinement that's gone into making sure that that all connects and does what it's supposed to do and gives the right feedback. Um, so, so this is a complicated device um, anyway. Um, and, but I think that, yeah, and, and quite often um, the assembly and how things need to go together is, is worked through as part of a prototype, especially a later stage, you know, functional prototype where you're looking at maybe, you know, very high fidelity um, 3D prints, which represent the product. Um, and then you can do test assemblies and, and kind of really start to sort of validate the assembly process. So, um, yeah, I mean, some, some products, this is a good example of, you know, a very uh, dense, you know, sort of part dense product. Uh, it's not very large, but there's a lot going on inside it. Um, yeah, but, but not all of them are sort of got this much stuff going on. The screws are, yeah, I mean, there are screws. Screws are quite good um, in terms of being able to secure things and, and know that they're going to stay put. Um, clips are cheap. Uh, the problem with clips is that sometimes molding the clips can be a challenge. Um, you know, there's various techniques that you can do in tools to, to kind of do it, yeah, do it cheaply or semi cheaply, but there's often compromises, um, with that. So it's, it's usually a balance. And this is part of the design process is working through the pros and cons of, of various techniques, um, for assembly and, and and yeah, really just choosing the best that's going to give us, you know, the best performance or best cost or whatever the objective is at the time. Um, yeah. And, and I think maybe going back to your comment about the, the final part cost or product costs. Um, yeah. Sometimes that the performance is a higher, has a higher sort of, you know, priority over the, over the cost. And in those cases, um, you know, we choose the assembly methods that, that give us the best performance. Um, so it varies, yeah, depending on what the product objectives are and the requirements. Thank you. It's all right. I'm just noting we've got about 10 minutes left, so, um, yeah, I'll, uh, distracting I'll, you too much. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. I'll, I'm, uh, I'll punch through the rest. Um, <clears throat> in a previous place of employment, there was always this expectation that you just get it right first time. <laughs> and sometimes we did. Um, but yeah, the design process is, um, this core of it here is, which is the same diagram as before, but this core of it is, is really developing and advancing the design and our understanding, um, and needs to be, uh, I think, I think is a really important part of aspect of the design is, is working through it. And I think for clients, that's, it's one of those things that maybe they don't understand that it needs to be developed. You know, that we need to iterate several times and um, for them, it's often a learning experience that, you know, we start off, you know, a bit more simplified and, you know, larger solving bigger problems. And then we continue to refine. <clears throat> um, and then at the end, it's, you know, once we've sort of resolved the design and we have a full um, set of documentation, um, yeah, we've, we collect all that, especially in medical devices, we collect all that documentation for verification validation. Um, yeah, and we, we put that together with the, um, manufacturing data, um, in medical devices that can often mean, you know, sort of labeling packaging, um, and that kind of thing as well. So, um, so all of that goes together in, in sort of a package, which can then go to the manufacturer. Um, and then. Uh, of course, there's also um, extra collateral that may be built from from that product, um, CAD renderings, um, and that kind of thing, animations, all of that, which is then used to, uh, you know, as collateral. Uh, so I'll just go through this fairly quickly because I have actually spoken to most of this. Um, and this is one of the things that I quite like about industrial design is and sort of leans into the psychology side of it a little bit is that um is the human-centered design and it's really understanding how we as humans 
kind of behave. You know, we have a lot of learned behaviors and we have a lot of, sort of intuitive, you know, um, innate behaviors. Uh, and, and what those are varies between people and varies between cultures. And um, we, um, you know, and that really sort of provides a framework for how we perceive the world around us and, you know, how we interact with things. Um, and this is, it's not a, this framework isn't quantifiable. It's something that is, you know, very subjective and, um, you know, we need to, uh, we need to understand that. Um, yeah, so that's sort of, this is sort of the area that I, I really like to sort of work in and, and understanding users and, and how they use things. And you know, my, my experience in orthopedics is a, is a perfect example, you know, where you design things how you think it might be used and, and then clinicians will actually use it completely differently. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, you know uh, a customer once used the whole thing upside down because he just liked it better that way. Um, so, so understanding those users and, um, and the context that they're using them in and why he wants to hold it upside down is, uh, is really important. And that sort of goes into the psychology side of things that's, uh, that it's really fun as, you know, part of industrial design. Um, yeah, so there's sort of two real aspects that I, you know, in terms of the product design, um, that I, that I like to sort of consider is, is this visual communication side of things, um, visual and tactile. So visual is, is really, you know, when we design the form of a product, it's, it's not necessarily just for, you know, what it looks like, you know, the art side of it, but it's also, you know, ergonomics. Um, but again, it's the visual communication and, and what, what the product tells us um you know in to how to use it you know just by our understanding of its form um yeah and a good classic example here is you know there's a is children's toys you know the the visual language of a product is different for, for the different groups and there's probably no more clear example than um you know children's toys you know toddlers have these very large chunky you know toys with very bright you know colors and and um, that's really geared for how they understand things. Maybe it goes a little bit overboard sometimes, but because uh, they may not care that much. But you know, but we act, but that sort of design language, um, as an example, is is quite often used as a um, you know used to tell a user how to how to use the product without actually having to you know actually tell them. Um, and I've just dropped in here six oh six oh one is as you know yeah. There's a full, there's a, there's standards around, you know, certain colors, say for indicator LEDs and things like that, um, that are sort of this agreed visual language in some areas. Um, but a lot of it is often quite, um, it's much less quantifiable than that. Um, and tactile feedback, you know, I think that this is one of the things I think is starting to take a little bit of a back seat now that, you know, we have a lot of you know, digital and internet enabled devices. Um, you know, we're seeing less knobs and buttons on, on many devices, even kitchen appliances, um, you know, being replaced with touch screens. Um, but I think tactile, especially in medical devices, um, is a really important aspect of how a device communicates with the user. Um, you know, how things click and, you know, how things slide and all of that, it gives, it gives a non-verbal information back to the user and, and tells them you know, how they're using the you know, device and if they're doing it correctly or not. Um, you know, I think, and in medical devices, this is, this is really important because clinicians may actually not be able to look at the unit um, that they're using. They're actually heavily relying on that tactile feedback to, um, you know, to give us the information we need or they need. I'm with you on this line, um, Lincoln. The, yeah. Having... Um was doing a kitchen renovation at the moment and you can't actually buy um, an appliance for your kitchen now that actually has a knob on it, even a microwave. You can't mm. turn it on and dial it up and press start. You've got to go through a whole user interface of a touch screen and it's, yeah. I personally find it quite annoying. Um, and yeah, I just, yeah. I just wonder whether it's going to have its limits, um, particularly in the medical device space. Yeah. Yeah, my, one of the ones I like to gripe about is the um, the touchscreen in the Teslas. You know, it's 
the touch screen's great in terms of that information and you know maps and all that kind of stuff but you can't there's a lot of functions that you can't do without taking your eyes off the road um so there's in that situation i think there's safety considerations um whereas back in the day you know you sort of got the cassette tape player with the with a very large volume knob that you can turn it up without even looking at it. Um, <clears throat> so I think that, yeah, I think that, yeah, the, it, these digital interfaces won't go away. It'll be, and now that we're starting to become a bit mature, more mature in what that is, uh, what they look like and how it's used, there will become a balance um, between, you yeah, know, what's digital and what's analog in terms of that, tact, you know, tactile feedback. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of it. Um, you know, the, both of these, you know, visual and tactile languages are, you know, really important um, and need to be considered in the context of who's using it and how they're using it. Um, and industrial designers, I think, go, go a long way to understand these behaviours uh, to develop these intuitive products. And that's it. Have a go for time. I've lost him. I can you hear some clicking? Hey, Tim. Sorry, I had myself on mute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've just been talking for the last 30 seconds. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, look. Um, yeah, look, um, we don't typically get a lot of questions because we the Q and A ants, you know, the, the radio interview style tends to answer that. If there are any questions, type them into the Q and A panel now, and uh, I'll ask them on your behalf. But um, one area I did want to ask you about was color, because you talked about visual and tactile. Mm -hmm. but I know particularly from an aesthetics point of view, uh, color is really important and for branding and product identity and so forth. It's often, yeah. in, you know, in, in the packaging materials, can be a really critical part of the whole project. Yeah. Um, is that an equally big area or is that something that's, you know, not so important? Um, no, it's massive. Um, you know, and there's a whole sort of color theory, um, you know, sort of uh, discussion out there, you know, and how the, the color of things, yeah, it, it, again, it tells us what we use the product for. But it also, um, yeah, it sort of sets um, the tone for what we think of the product and and how we're supposed to. The um, it makes us feel certain ways, you know, colors and you know certain colors are you know you, you think about like um, you know hospitals painted you know subdued pastel colors is to help you know cut, you're supposed to be calming and that kind of thing and you know if you imagine if hospitals were painted to have, you know bright orange high vis orange you know there'd be it that'd be quite uh no one would like it you know so yeah th so the and colors is yeah and i was really interested in your you know your venn diagram at the start where you had psychology as, as your third sort of will yeah. we didn't we sort of touched on the psychology a few times but how would you break down the whole psychology piece you know into the way you really get into the heads of of the users um or a device? Um, yeah, it's, I guess it's a tricky one. Um, and I, I suppose it depends on on the device and, and how far we needed to get into users' heads. Um, I, I think that, um, and, and often it's very hard to do full stop, you know, and that's why you've got to do, you've got to have the users directly use it and then sort of observe um, you, what their behaviors. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and it's usually, you know, Psychology is maybe the, you know, it's maybe not quite the right word, but it's very much um, understanding what users are thinking um, and why they're thinking it. And I think that quite often we'll try and identify specific areas of behavior that are important to the product. So kind of filtering out, you know, because we're, we're not psychologists, we're industrial designers, but we try and, um, you know, really zero in on the aspects of their behavior and their thinking that are important to the device design. And then, um, you know, studying that and understanding that and applying it to the design. So I do wonder if there's a sort of scope for, you know, developing that whole area of industrial design, because um, 
you know, as an engineer, I, I like to um, really, you know, break things down and be methodical about things. And I, I know that with um, psychologists, you know, if, if you talk to clinical psychologists, and I, I know a few friends, and they really break it down, like, you know, like you have, um, you know, the, they have different, um, I forget the terminology, but psyches or, or, or psych, um, psychological triggers for various conditions. And mm. um, just by asking a very structured set of questions, they can really narrow in on what the particular problems are and, yeah. and, and so forth and give them labels and, and so forth. And so, yeah. um, you know, I, I wonder whether um, with particularly as we're talking about medical devices where, you know, uh, there's such a thin line between a physical condition and a mental condition and, mm. and the way the product, you know, the e efficacy of the product, you know, you just mentioned color then, mm. you know, um, the color device can have a, you know, or an environment can have an impact on, you know, whether the device is working or has a placebo effect. So there's, I imagine there's quite a lot of scope for, um, you know, um, you know yeah, necessary. that's yeah, that's right. And I think that, and this is maybe one of, this is maybe why it's one of my areas, you know, that I really quite enjoy working in is because, um, yeah, there's a lot of room to kind of try and understand how people think and, and why they think that way. And um, yeah, and, and because it's done very early on, you know, we're trying to understand what the requirements are and, and why. Um, there's There's lots of room to develop and you know, sort of work through those problems and understand the users and, and then test those ideas or the solutions with the, with those users. Mm. Um, usually the limitation comes down to a budget constraints. Um, so we can sort of allocate time to do that, but, but quite often the, you know, you can spend a lot of time doing it if the, if the budget allows. So, um, all of it's, it's all on a sliding scale based on, uh, you know, based on the project. You mentioned budget there. We do, do have one question that's come in from Luke Gordon, uh, who describes himself as a PhD student at mm -hmm. University of Sydney. Um, for a startup with little money, what would be your suggestions to try and mitigate costs before coming to teledesign, e.g. doing as much prototyping as possible in our own hands? Um, or do you encourage an early meeting even before Tiller is engaged to discuss a project plan? And that is, you know, that is a perennial problem because, you know, uh, industrial design can um, cost, you know, anything from, you know, a few tens of thousands of dollars to several hundreds of thousands of dollars um, or even more um, for mm. very, very complex projects. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts about startups? And um, yeah, I think that it, I think um, it's quite often good to to break it up into little chunks. Um, so rather than you know committing to a full full development. Um, you know, especially at a very, very early stage where there's a lot of questions still outstanding. Um, I think that it's important to engage industrial designers early, um, even if it's a small, say, packet of work, just to help work through some of the outstanding questions. Um, it might help clarify some of the objectives. Um, and I think applying that sort of design thinking to, I hesitate to use the word, but, you know, applying some of that design thinking to, um, you know, uh, to solve some of the very early problems and get a you know, bit of an understanding of those objectives is, is of value. Um, and then, and we actually have, that happens quite often where we have, we'll have clients that will come in and help us work through some of you know, the early problems and, and um, get some proof of concepts uh, going, which can then be taken away and tested and evaluated. And, and that helps, you know, build the understanding on the product and then they come back and we can um, then you know do the full product development from there um, so yeah it could be you know just a very small scope to, you know early on to to help um, you know harness some of that you know lateral thinking and some of that experience and and try and sort of get a bit of an understanding around how it may translate from its current idea to a product um, it certainly can offer a lot of clarity you know just as a small work scope yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I've never met a consultant yet who didn't say that it's good to consult early. <laughs> <laughs> they always seem to be, seems to think. Um, one thing I would say, Luke, you know, part of the purpose of this community is uh, on the recordings page of our community, 
Uh, we've got 18 webinars up there. I've got another um, three that I still have to upload. Um, so there'll be 21 webinars up there and uh, um, watching all 21 webinars, I suggest, is a, a very good thing to do because you'll get lots of tips and tricks um, on what, what you should be doing uh, early, uh, you know, to mitigate those, those costs. And I do know um, with industrial signs, one of the great things, of course, is you can get some good concept renderings that help you go to investors and sort of convince them that it's almost there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, even though it's, you only got a, it's only a twinkling in your eye and that's just can be very helpful, can't it? Yeah, it's, it can also be a bit of a trap. You know, sometimes they, they look at these renderings and because they look, especially, you know, now, 10 years ago, it was a, maybe a different question, but they look so real that they think they're real. You know, investors can, <laughs> you know, they be get the wrong assumption. Yeah, that's be right. You're disappointed like, when, when they find it's going to take two years to actually... That's right. Yeah. So this thing that looks so like it's, finished. Hmm. it's a bit of a balance, but yeah, I mean, it's, there's value to add, you know, by, by generating, you know, rough CAD models that look right. Um, even though maybe they don't have all the internal detail um, and generating rending, renderings for that. And it can certainly go a long way to promoting your idea. Sure. Look, um,